All right, how's everybody doing today? You doing good? Good seeing all of you. So glad that you're here today, whether you're in the room watching online. Big shout out to those that are watching online. Will you join me in welcoming those that are watching somewhere on the other side of that camera? It's gonna be a special day today. We have a good friend of ours in town, friends of ours in town. Pastor Kerry Robinson and his wife Megan are here with us this weekend. They pastor Movement Church in Orange County, California. Great pastors, great leaders, but they're really good friends. And uh, you know, I read a statistic recently that said that the majority of pastors don't have any friends they can confide in. And uh, pastors at times are friends with everybody, but friends with no one. You got a lot of friends. And there's a verse that says that, that if you have a bunch of acquaintances and people just know you can come to ruin, but there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And uh, I want you to know that I'm grateful that not only do I have a lot of a, a, a people that I know, but I have people that know me. And, uh, and so Pastor Kerry, you're gonna hear from a, a, from a real friend. And, uh, and as a result, my life is enriched and blessed. And, and so it's a real honor to have Kerry and Megan with us. So let's, let's receive him like one of our own. And I know that some of you are showed up going, okay, are we doing the relationship series anymore? We figured we, didn't, we had enough persecution, you know, we're not gonna persecute you anymore. And so today you're going to hear from one of the best, Pastor Kerry Robinson. So why don't you stand on your feet if we can and show some love, show some honor to Pastor Kerry Robinson as he comes. Come on, can we give Jesus a hand clap? Come on. Like you mean it. Come on, church. Amen. Listen, what a beautiful house. You did it. You moved in. Can we give yourselves a hand clap for building this amazing facility, for being a great church? Turn to somebody next to you, give them a high five or a fist bump, tell them they look a little better than last week. I'm just so honored to be with you today and I uh, wanna share a couple of thoughts. Pastor Josh told me this is the last service so I can preach for two hours, so I'm super stoked about that. Greetings from the communist state of California. We're so, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. You were thinking it. I've had like five guys say, you sure you don't wanna stay? <laughs> I'm contemplating. So I've already asked Pastor Josh for a job. No, I'm kidding. Hey, before I dive in, I just wanna take a minute and honor your pastors. You know, uh, literally just, I think a little over a year ago, I got a chance to spend a week with Pastor Josh and we became fast friends. And uh, what I love is I got to meet him in a relationship of friendship, but I didn't even know him as a pastor. And I can just tell you through and through his character and integrity is outstanding. And uh, I'm just inspired by him and by Kristen and what you've walked through. In fact, I was thinking about you guys. And uh, in 1910, Teddy Roosevelt was standing before an assembly in Paris who had just been ravaged by a flood and he gave a speech. And I, I literally thought about you guys and thought of this speech it's been coined the man in the arena, but I just wanna read it and honor your pastors for a moment. It says this, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errors, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who actually does strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly so that for his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. And when I think about Pastor Josh and Kristen, I think about a man and a woman who stand in the arena. Are you grateful for your pastors? Come on, can we give it up for great leaders? We're grateful for you, we honor you. If I lived in Florida, I probably wouldn't go to church here, but I'd think of, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, I just wanna, just, I, I can't stand here and not honor your pastors. I'm so grateful for them, how they inspire me. Let me just tell you, uh, my name is Kerry. I'm from Orange County, California, which is an hour in between in Los Angeles and San Diego. You probably heard of Laguna Beach. That's where we're at. And my wife and I moved there about 11 years ago to plant our church. We didn't know anybody in the area. 
and we just parachuted in, and uh, it has been a crazy journey. My wife is with me. Wave, babe, would you wave your hand? This is my wife, Megan. Y'all give it up for my beautiful baby. We are high school sweethearts. She was a senior in high school. I was a sophomore, so that makes her my cougar. Come on, somebody. That joke never gets old, and I will make it until the day I die. She's like, well, you're only a year younger, but she was born in the 70s. I was born in the 80s. Come on, somebody. I think they got a picture of my family. We've got two beautiful daughters. Our oldest is Brooklyn. She's a senior in high school, so I'm about to have to pay for college. Y'all pray for me. And uh, my youngest, Avery, she's in seventh grade, and she's like a prouncing alpaca with a confetti cannon. It's a party, but here's what happens. Estrogen wafts through my house like humidity. If I didn't live in California, I would find a field, shoot a gun, pick up the cartridge and smell the gunpowder to remind myself I'm still a man. We just cry in our household sometimes. One time my kid came home from school and she was crying and my wife was like, go in there. And she's like, what's wrong? I don't know. And I was like, obviously something's wrong. I go talk to my wife, like, what do I do? She said, just hold her. So I go back in and I'm like, but for real, stop crying. Y'all pray for me. I need some help, man, I do. But we, uh, we do love this phase of life. It's a lot of fun because my oldest started driving and we don't have to do half the errands that we used to do. Anybody got driving kids in the house? It's amazing. Wish we had started there. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Our church has been going, uh, I don't know if you know this, but California is as crazy as you read about in the newspaper. Remember when COVID hit and two weeks later, y'all were like, we ain't taking it. Well, the rest of the world didn't do that. I don't, know if we're, I don't know if I'm allowed to breathe outside. They tell me it's been crazy, but uh, it's a real cool thing. In the last uh, nine and a half years, we've seen just under 3,000 people say yes to Jesus. Come on, can we give a hand clap for that? It's a real mission field, and uh, I love my state. I love what God's doing here, and I love what God's doing in California, and I believe the greatest days of the church are still ahead. In the darkest hours of our nation, it's the time for the church to do the greatest things. Can I get an amen? Let me read some scriptures. I'm gonna preach in 27 minutes and 37 seconds. If you listen fast. They told me second service was feisty and I already feel it, so I'm grateful for you. It's because you slept in. Let's just get the, the picture straight. And, and welcome to those of you who are online who also slept in. <laughs> We're glad you're tuning in with us. Let me read two scriptures, we'll dive in. First Kings chapter 19, it says this. So he departed from there and found Elisha the son of Shaphat, which sounds like Christian cussing, but we'll move on, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the 12th. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, go back again, for what have I done to you? And he, Elisha, returned from following him and took the yoke of, yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yoke of oxen. And he gave it to the people and they ate. They had a party. Then he arose and he went after Elijah and assisted him. One more verse, Romans 12. And then we'll pray and we'll dive in. I love this scripture. And I think it's what God wants to speak to us today. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out, readily recognizing what he wants from you and quickly responding to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings out the best of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. The title of my message today is, I think about it every night and day. I wanna pray for us, but before we do that, we just, everybody look up at me for a minute. Man, I've been in church my whole life. I'm a third generation preacher's kid. My dad was a Southern Baptist preacher. I was born in Marietta, Georgia. I have an accent, I just hide it in California. And man, I know what it's like to show up to church just thinking about where I'm gonna eat lunch and get back into my day and, oh, we miss opportunities. The creator of heavens and the earth, the one who placed the stars in the sky, the, the one who knelt down and formed creation and breathed life into Adam 
is here right now. And he wants to do the miraculous in your life. Not the ordinary, not the mundane, the miraculous. So don't stop him. When I pray, would you just sincerely just pray and open your hearts and your minds to whatever it is that God wants to do in the next 24 minutes and 39 seconds. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? God, we thank you that you're here. We thank you that you're up to something big. We fix our attention on you. In Jesus' mighty and precious name we pray. And everyone said, amen. And that just means I agree. Romans 12 says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. And I think that so many of us fall into this category all too often. The question I would ask is, are you up and awake to the things that God wants to do in your life? I'm not talking about just being attached to and connected to a church, but are you up and awake to the things that God has uniquely planned for you and your future? The greatest days of your life are still ahead of you. He's the God of exceedingly, abundantly, or above. And I love that about who we are as America, but I'm afraid that over the past two years, we've kind of allowed the dreaming to die. America's built on the, the fact that we can do anything we set our minds to, but more importantly, it's established in the fact that the word of God, that that's his heart for us. He's a God of dreams. He's the giver of dreams. And I believe that's for you today. Are you up and awake to the things that God has for you? I love that that's who we are created to be. It reminds me of the, Old Bible verse that goes something like this. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. Come on. I think about it every night and day. Yeah, come on. I spread my wings and fly away. I believe I can soar. Come on. I see me running through that open door. I believe I can. Come on, give yourself a hand clap, man. And this lady back here was getting into the groove. She was like, uh, I believe I, she hit that falsetto too. I felt it, it was good. I just am afraid that over the last 24 months, we've settled into a risk averse lifestyle. We've just stopped dreaming, stopped believing big things, stopped risking. And I think one of the reasons is because if we don't dream big, then we won't be discouraged. And we've allowed disappointment and discouragement to lower the horizons of what God wants to do in our life. But can you be up and awake? We find Elisha in this story holding the plow, but with anticipation. His hands were to the plow, but his head was up. It says in 1 Kings that Elisha was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and Elijah passed by and threw his cloak upon him. And can I just pause right here and say, it's really frustrating that it's Elijah and Elisha. The ja and the sha is confusing, right? I'm a little frustrated that God just didn't choose Elijah and Steve. Wouldn't that have been a lot easier in the story? I'm gonna get it mixed up quite a few times, but regardless, we find Elisha is plowing in anticipation, which means that he's going backwards and forward over a plot of land. I hope my shoe squeaks like that every time. Day in and day out, over and over and over again. And some of you are right here right now. You've been doing the same things every day for the past few weeks, months, years, and for some of us, decades. And some of us, it's because it's just safe. It just makes sense. I get up, I make my coffee, I go to work, I do what I need to do, I come home, I try to be a good husband or a good wife, I say hi to the kids, we eat dinner, we go to bed, and we wake up and we do it again the next day. I wake up, I take the kids to school, I go to gym, I come back and do laundry because laundry never stops, can I get an amen? And I cook food and we eat and we go to sleep and we do it again and we do it again and we've settled for a mundane and a marginalized life. It's called being in a rut. There's a highway that stretches from the lower 48 up all the way to Alaska and in the 60s it wasn't paved. And there were signs that would tell you, be careful which rut you choose because you're gonna be in it for the next 200 miles. Because the ruts would become so deep that wheels could not steer in or out of it. You were just stuck. 
And some of us are there right now, just holding the plow with our head down. And we stopped dreaming. I mean, we had a moment where God spoke to us. We had a moment where God called us. We had a moment where God reminded us of our future, but man, it just became too frustrating. And now, you know what the truth is? I'll just choose predictable pain rather than uncertain gain. And you're stuck in a rut. You just settled for a marginalized life. People get here all the time. It doesn't take much work, but then there's some of us in this room and instead of holding the plow, your head is just up. You held the plow for like two days. You're like, nope, I'm done. I mean, you're following oxen, which means that they're going to the restroom right where I'm walking. There's stones I'm tripping over. This is frustrating. It's hot outside. I'm just tired of it. And you're frustrated and you moved on and, and your head is up, but you have never held the plow. So some of us in this room are stuck in the rut with our head down, only holding the plow. And some of us have never even held the plow. We've never worked diligently at one thing forever, any amount of time, and our head is just up. So some of you actually just need to hold down a job. Can I get an amen? You know, there's this new thing in corporate America where if you move around from company to company, it looks better on your resume because they think you're more attractive. And I think that's ridiculous. I don't want to hire somebody who can't hold down a J-O-B. Do you know how I got into ministry? I was an intern and I raised money to be an intern. I wrote letters back in, the, I literally wrote letters and I sent it to people and said, hey, I feel called to ministry. My church can't afford me. Would you pay me like a missionary to work at my church? And people did. I made $800 a month and my father-in-law said I could marry my wife. I don't know what he was thinking. If some dude came to me, I'd be like, get to step and sign, go get a J-O-B. And I interned at my church, you know what I did? I cleaned toilets, and I'm scrubbing below the toilets, and I'm going, God, this is not my calling. And can I just tell you, ladies, your restroom is 10 times worse than the men's restroom. Get a hold of it. Get a hold of it. Things are in there that no one should ever see. It's terrifying. I needed counseling just from cleaning in the women's restroom. And I'm going, God, you didn't make me to do this. Are you tracking? We find Elisha holding the plow, but with anticipation. So there are two groups of people. Maybe you're holding the plow, but your head is down, and God sent me to tell you, keep your head up. Be up and awake. But there are some of you in this room, you've never held the plow a day in your life, and your head is up, and God sent me to tell you, hold the plow. Be diligent with what is in your hands, because what God gave you now, he wants you to steward well. So we find Elisha with his hand to the plow, but his head up in anticipation. So what's a practical for you and for me today? Start every morning asking God what he has next for you. And then hold the plow the whole day. Tomorrow, waking up, wake up and just say, God, what do you have for me and for my family? Because if you want it for me, I want it for me. And I promise you, the creator of the heavens and earth has a plan for you today and a plan for you tomorrow. And he'll take care of it. So turn to your neighbor and say, hold the plow. Turn to your second choice and say, keep your head up. Second, we see that Elisha's sacrifice was huge. Elijah walks back by and he throws his cloak on Elisha. The cloak was a representation of who Elijah was. It represented that he was a prophet of God, a man of God that God would speak to for the nations. It was also the same cloak that Elijah was wearing just a few chapters prior where God had a major encounter with him. We found Elisha. I did it. We found Elijah. Just Steve. Wouldn't that just be great? Nobody's going to forget Steve. Any Steves in here? Be blessed. Highly favored. We find Elijah just a few chapters earlier hiding in a cave, depressed and frustrated. And God speaks to him, says, get out of the cave. And he goes out on the mountainside. And then the Bible says that a great earthquake comes and shakes the ground. And a great wind comes by and it moves the trees and a great fire consumes the earth. But God was not in the earthquake, the fire or the wind. And then the Bible says that God showed up in a still, small voice. 
And Elijah was wearing this cloak when God carved out the next steps for Elijah. And he comes down off the hill and he tosses the garment to Elisha. Hey, look at me for a moment and listen. What you are doing today will translate to the next generation. Whether your head is down or your head is up, if your hand is to the plow or if you're walking in disobedience, what you're doing today will translate to the next generation. The sacrifice for Elisha was great. The Bible says that he was behind 12 yoke of oxen, which obviously means in those times he was from a very wealthy, a very affluent family. Most farmers would maybe have one ox, maybe. We find Elisha with 12 oxen and he's in the back, which means he was in charge. It's very likely that Elisha was the heir apparent to receive the inheritance from his family. And when Elijah said, hey, here is my tunic, you come and follow me, Elisha knew that to do so means he's saying goodbye and good, God bless to my family and to my inheritance. The sacrifice was great. But not only that, Elijah was not a very popular dude. He was very hated at the time. When well, the Queen Jezebel was doing everything she could to kill and destroy the prophets of God, Elijah was public enemy number one. So for Elisha to follow Elijah, he knew not only am I saying goodbye to wealth and prosperity, but I'm also hitching my wagons to someone who is hated. I'm telling you, Elijah was so hated. Jezebel was so after him more than the Democratic Party is after DeSantis. I'm just telling you right now. Okay, it hit well. It hit real well in first service. I was nervous. Second service, man, this lady's like clapping. She just got freed right now. <laughs> Not a good time to follow Elijah. Not a good time. Sacrifice was great, and some of you in this room, you're holding the plow, your head is down, or maybe you've not, not held the plow, and you're just dreaming, and, and you're not really sure if the, if the dream, let me just say it this way, you're not really sure if the juice is worth the squeeze. You've counted the costs and you're not really sure if it's worth the ROI, but you may be fooled. Can I tell you that when you fail to pursue the God dreams, you'll substitute it with your own dream? And dealing with the consequences of your own dream is far more difficult than actually pursuing the God dream in the first place. Just ask Abraham. God came and spoke to Abraham and said, hey, I'm gonna make you the father of many nations. I'm gonna give you a promised land that will be for my people and from your lineage will come the savior of all mankind. And Abraham went back to the plow. A year passes. God, I, I still don't have any kids. You, you made a promise. Two years pass. Three years. God, I, I'm, I'm reaching 100. I'm getting old and if I'm gonna have kids, my wife's getting old too, it's not looking real good. 10 years pass. God had given Abraham a dream. He'd given him a promise, but Abraham decided that maybe it was up to him to take matters into his own hands. So Abraham and Sarah concoct a plan. He substituted the God dream with his own and Ishmael was born. And the sons of Ishmael and the sons of Isaac have been warring to this day ever since. Look at me in the eyes. If you don't pursue the God dream, you will substitute it with your own dream and dealing with the consequences of your own dream is far more difficult than actually pursuing the God dream in the first place. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him and he left the oxen and he ran after Elijah and he said, let me kiss my father and my mother and then I will follow you. Elisha knew the cost was great, but what I love is that he immediately, he followed Elijah and he said, hey, would you give me permission? Let me just go back, I'm in, I'm, I'm gonna follow you. I know what I'm saying no to, I know what I'm saying yes to and I'm, I'm in for the calling. If God wants it for me, I want it for me. Just let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And I love two things about this. Number one, I love that Elisha gave Elijah permission to speak into his life. And can I just encourage you for a moment, if you don't have someone who can speak into your life, 
and say, hey, stop being a knucklehead. Hey, you're better than this. Hey, the future is still bright. Hey, you, you, you are more than a conqueror. Hey, come on, clean up your act. Hey, get your butt back in church. Hey, come on, God is still faithful. If you don't have somebody that can speak into your life, you are headed on a crash course for destruction. And Elisha went to Elijah and submitted to him. Hey, can I just go back first and say goodbye? And Elisha said, absolutely go. The second thing I like from this is that Elisha chose to close the chapter well. He didn't just get a word from God and say, hey, aren't you glad you got to know me? See you later. <laughs> he went back and he gave his mother and father a kiss. He said, thank you for the investment. Thank you for pouring into me. Thank you for what you've done in my life. Thank you for who you are to me. Can I just tell you that you need to close chapters well. How you close this chapter has a profound impact on how you open the next. You know, when my wife and I were on staff, we met at a church in Dallas and we're on staff there for about six years and then God called us out to the Southeast Valley of Phoenix to a church plant to be on staff there and we served on that staff for five years. And I don't know if you know anything about Phoenix, but currently it's 100 in hell outside. Uh, every day of the year, December, June, January, it's always hot. Uh, Satan lives there, but uh, that's not important. <laughs> and uh, we were serving faithfully. It was a setup and a tear down, a portable church. And we were meeting in the cafe gymatorium of an elementary school where it smelled like the bologna and the Holy Spirit. And uh, every Sunday, it was, it was magical. And uh, we just felt like God was saying, hey, it's time. It's time to change gears. In fact, we were at a conference and we felt like God was stirring in our heart to go and plant a church and in California, but we didn't know anybody there and really barely knew how to do anything at all, let alone plant a church. And I don't know if you know this, but it's really expensive in California. Like a gallon of gas is $5.30 right now. That's demonic. Pray for me. And I was like, God, how are we gonna do this? And we were at a conference and God spoke so clearly to my wife and he said, hey, when you're brave enough to say it's time to go, I'll show you when and where. And she dragged me outside to tell me the story. And I'm like, God, why aren't you speaking to me? I'm the man of the household. And he said, I am speaking to you through your wife. And I was like, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, Let's, I guess we're gonna clap there, all right. <laughs> Not for the scripture, <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> Somebody got some freedom, amen. <laughs> and it was a terrifying notion of launching into a whole new culture, a whole new mission field. We didn't know anyone, but we felt God was pulling us to do so and we just prayed together in the car on our way to meet with our pastors. And we just said, we're gonna submit this to them and follow their leadership. So we sat down at a table at Outback Steakhouse over a Bloomin' Onion, because everything holy happens over fried food. Can I get an amen? That doesn't exist in California. It's just tofu and vegan stuff. <laughs> they know it tastes good. No, it doesn't. It tastes like dirt with cayenne pepper on it. Thank you but we'll live forever, yep, and we'll pay taxes forever too, hallelujah. I'm moving to Florida. Give me some fried catfish and some clogged arteries in Jesus' name. <laughs> Let's move on. And we just said, hey, we need to submit something to you. We feel like God is calling us to plant a church in California and we're terrified. What are we supposed to do? And it was like we slid over the, this option to them. Not, nothing actually was there. It was like, what, we submit this to you. Whatever you tell us to do, we'll follow it. And they began to cry. And we began to cry. And they said, we know God is in this. It's time to go plant your church. And we're gonna give you your salary for a year and a half. And I threw up in my mouth. You thought I was gonna say some faith-filled statement, like, thank God, we're ready. 
No, it was a reality. And the only way it was a reality is because they removed obstacles. And I believe they removed the obstacles because we were willing to close the chapter well. So whatever season and chapter you're in, close it well. Elisha kissed his mother and father. He kissed his mother and father. He threw a party for his friends. And he went in pursuit of what God had for him. So we find Elijah, his hands on the plow and his head up. He counted the cost and realized the sacrifice was great. But as it always is when following the voice of the Holy Spirit, it's worth it. And finally, Elisha burned the plow. And he returned from following him, took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen and he gave it to the people and they ate. And then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. This is the most significant part of the story because Elijah cut ties with the past. He went back to what he knew. He went back to what he had been comfortable in. He went back to what he had been doing his whole life. This was a potential future for him. This was an inheritance. This was financial security. This is a, a place in the family. He, he now is gonna be the heir apparent and he goes back and the Bible says that he tore apart the yoke and he sacrificed the ox and he said, this life is no longer for me. It's a part of who I am but it is not a part of my future. God has more in store for my future than anything I have seen to date, but he didn't just kind of flirt with the past and flirt with the future. He burned the yoke and he sacrificed the oxen. He said, I'm done. I'm saying goodbye. I'm pressing on to the upward call of Christ Jesus, just like Paul said, forgetting what lies behind. And I just came to tell you all the way from California to be up and awake to what God wants to do in your future. But that means you gotta keep your hands to the plow. Don't get discouraged in the mundane. Don't get discouraged in the normal, but don't let the normal become everything to you. Don't become so satisfied in what is safe that you fail to take big steps of faith, to take big risks for what God has in front of you. And when that day comes, Close the chapter well, but say goodbye to the past. Some of you are clinging to something that God does not have for you. Some of you are trying to pursue God while dating someone you have no business dating. Some of you have surrendered to God with almost everything, but just not with your finances. Isn't it interesting? We want God to take our past from us and show us grace and forgiveness and I'll follow him, but I have a hard time with my pocketbook. And yet the Bible says so clearly that I can find my heart where my treasure is. Some of you lo love the Lord, but you're hiding a lifestyle that's contrary to the word of God. And you think your private rebellion is hurting no one. But what you're doing today will translate to the next generation. It translates to the next generation. A, a great friend of ours says, what walks with the fathers runs with the sons. You know God wants something for you, but you've settled for a marginalized life. Stop clinging to something that God doesn't have for you. Elijah said goodbye to the life he wasn't created to live. It's time for you to say goodbye to the sin which should so easily entangle you. Some of you need to say goodbye to a life of bitterness and unforgiveness. You're holding on to a hurt that took place days, weeks, months, years ago. Well, Pastor Kerry, you don't know what they said, what they did, how they abandoned me, and they should have been there and they weren't. They violated me, they left. I don't know if I can ever forgive it. Okay, I get it, I wasn't there, and I'm sure the pain is great, but the only person you are hurting now is you. You're trying to pursue what God has while holding on to the plow and the oxen. Maybe for you today, it's just about choosing to forgive. Some of you need to say goodbye to a meaningless meanderings. 
You know, one of the things I'm grateful for about living in the great state of California, it keeps me on my toes. It's crazy there. That's real. Like what you read in the news is real. The city that I live in is 9% churched. Within 15 minutes of me are 2.7 million unchurched people. It keeps me on my toes. Sometimes I get a little concerned about states where it's a little easier. It's not as hard here. Everybody goes to church and they play baseball. Can I just challenge you? Don't fall so easy into this life that you forget God's heart for you and the future that's ahead of you. Say goodbye to a marginalized life. What if we live life ready to take a leap of faith. God, what do you have? What is next for Liberty Church? What is next for the people of this church? Where are you taking us? What do you have? What do you wanna do? I believe this next season, God wants to raise up entrepreneurs, men and women who start businesses that honor God and build the kingdom. But we can't do that unless we take some risk. What if that's ahead of you, but you can't see it because you're stuck in this rut? God's got a business inside of you. It's been there for days, for weeks, for months, for years, but you can't see it because this is safe. This is easy. I can do this. I know how to do it. It always works. We plant and then we sow. We plant and we sow, but God's like, okay, fine, but there's more. Exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you ask or imagine. Be up and awake. Sure, keep your hands in the plow. Get your head up. It may cost you, it may cost you everything, but it'll be worth it. And when the time comes, burns the plows. Burn the plows, shake your neighbor, say burn the plows. Shake your second choice, say burn the plow. Let me take just a few moments, I'm already two minutes over my time, and talk to those of you who need to begin the journey with Jesus. Hey, listen, there's a starting point. It's not church membership. It's not church attendance. Or in California, they would say just putting out good vibes. I don't know how you do that. Is this how you put out good vibes? Like you all, you can good vibes. That's what you do. No, there's a starting point. And it's just saying yes to Jesus. And there's some of you in this room who've never begun the journey. And you know what's so crazy? All of us in this room are here for you. That's why we exist. And there's some of you in this room who may have begun the journey, but you've been running from God. You went back to the plow. You went back to the oxen. You've been stuck in the rut. And today's your day to come running back. There are some of you who are watching online and today is your day. This is your moment. So I wanna ask everybody in this room, nobody moving, would you just bow your heads, close your eyes if you're online. As long as you're not driving, close your eyes, bow your heads. And if you're here and you've never begun the journey with Jesus or you wanna begin again for the first time in a long time to make this prayer your own. Don't make it a fake prayer, make it a real one from the depths of your heart. I'm gonna give you the words, you just repeat them after me in the small whisper of the quietness of your own heart, just say, dear God, I know that you love me, that you've given me purpose. I'm not perfect. Will you forgive me? I wanna be up and awake to all that you have for me. Make these words your own. Just say, Jesus, I give you my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Head still bowed, eyes still closed, nobody moving, nobody looking around. Would you do me a favor? I, I came all the way from California for this moment right now. In a moment, I'm gonna count to three, and if you prayed that prayer with me for the first time or the first time in a long time, when I get to three, would you just put your hand up? You're saying, Pastor Kerry, I prayed that prayer. Pastor Kerry, that's me. I, I'm jumping in. I'm going all in with God. If that's you on the count of three, put your hands up. Ready? One, two.
two, three. Lift your hands. Wow, all over the room. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All the way in the back, thank you. On the left side here, you can put your hands down. Anyone else? Wow, 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 wow. Anyone else? God, we give you the honor and the glory, and we thank you that you're doing something amazing in this moment. Lord, help us to hold the plow with our head up. Lord, we acknowledge the sacrifice is worth it. We're saying goodbye to the things that would hold us back, and we're running full steam ahead into all that you have for us. In Jesus' mighty and precious name we pray, and everybody said amen and amen.